So there are degrees of importance to prophets. This one is more important than that one and so on. But there's another verse that tells the believer that we are not to make any distinction among the prophets. So there may be this prophet that's superior to that prophet, superior to this prophet, and so on. But you, the believer, are supposed to treat them all the same. That's a command. It's God who makes the distinctions. And you, the believer, have no business saying, well, this one ranks above that one. The ayah says, we make no distinction among any of them. That's the business of Allah, not the business of us. He will make it clear to us, as it says so many times, that on many other subjects, the truth of the matter will be made clear to you on the last day. In the meantime, follow these instructions, and you can't go wrong. So it is that the Muslim reminds himself and others that the priority in the Quran is, as I've said several times in different circumstances, the priority is not to tell the non-Muslim you should turn your back on what you have and come with me. The priority is first to tell the person what you have you should re-examine. Commit no excesses. It addresses various groups by names, the Christians and the Jews and the Sabaeans and the Magians and so on, and tells them, commit no excess in your religion. It doesn't say, leave your religion. That's step two, three, or four, maybe, but it starts off by saying, commit no excess. Don't say more than you have the right to say. So if you tell me, as a Christian, for example, points one, two, and three, I might agree with you. When you get to point number four, you may say something for which there's no proof. And the Muslim wants to say, if you can't prove that, why don't you just set it aside? Stick with what you can prove. Because we both believe what you can prove. We have proof. Another thing can follow if a nation becomes so interested in the man instead of what he said. It's an automatic thing that most often uh, comes. If the emphasis is on the speaker and not the speech, racial pride and nationalism start to stir up in people. If the emphasis is on the messenger, so it is that a lot of religions are named after men. A lot of religions are named after the places where they came from. This can be trouble. I'm not saying it always is, but it can be trouble because it means maybe the emphasis is in the wrong place. You're not talking about the message if you're talking about the place where it came from. More often than this, maybe, what happens is in order to compensate for uh, maybe lost pride or something, you may have a group of people who they follow a religion, but the so-called founder or the messenger came from some other place or some other racial background. So as they start to develop their picture of who was the messenger, it starts to get bent into the shape of what they look like or where they come from. As somebody said only a generation ago, God is an American. Like some people will tell you today he's a Republican. He's not only an American, he belongs to this party. So it was that you have a, a movie, which, uh, you know, a cinema, a motion picture, that has been around for some time now, Jesus of Nazareth. It's interesting that the man who plays Jesus in that movie has blue eyes. It's extremely unlikely that Jesus had blue eyes, considering who his ancestry was, but the bulk of the people who appreciate him and the part of the world where they made that movie can understand a man with blue eyes better than one with black eyes, I guess. But you see, what causes that kind of shift is that the emphasis is on a man instead of what did he say. So you tend to want to make that man a lot like you. If this, these uh, verses tell half the story, that is, that half the story of religion is because people shifted from the message to the messenger, uh, the other half of the story would uh, just about be covered by another verse in the Quran that tells us about the source of a lot of, of deviation and why are there many religions. It's in the third surah and the sixth 
Hiya, our verse. It tells us in that place that the Quran has two kinds of verses in it. But the verses are either muhkamat or mutashabihat. And that verse is quoted by Muslims a lot. Excuse me, they quote half that verse a lot. They don't usually quote the whole thing. They quote enough of it to try to tell you that the Quran is a very dangerous thing to read. Only a few people can understand it because, look, some of the verses are mutashabihat, which they tell you means secret. Only a few people know. You have to trust them to tell you. If they keep reading, that's exactly the opposite of what's being discussed. It tells you that, yes, there are two kinds of verses, but anybody who tells you that they know all about these secret ones, watch out for him. That's the man who will mislead you. It's a warning. There's no mystery about the meaning of that ayah. Muhkamat is one kind of a verse. It comes from an Arabic root that means locked, or locked in place. The root is ahkam. What is locked in place, muhkamat, would be like an item in a piece of machinery that is so tightly fixed in the machine that when the machine runs, it doesn't shake. It's locked in place. Some of the verses of the Quran are like that. It means you can't take them any place, you can't make them mean anything except what they say. The first verse of that chapter says, Allah, la ilaha illahu. That is Allah. There is no deity but He. Now people cannot sit around and argue about what do you think that means. It only has one meaning. That's muhkamat. That's something like, it, it, the better word in English might be explicit. When you go to a shop and the sign is hanging on the door and it says closed, you don't turn to your friend and say, what do you think is meaning of that? How do you interpret closed? It, it says what it means, there's no discussion, we all know. That's explicit. And some of the verses of the Quran are said to be moved to shabihat which comes from a verb in the shabha that means could be mukashabi hat sometimes it's translated in english as ambiguous i don't like that really uh, maybe a better word would be con similar it means it has a sh shared similarity to sacrifice a cow and they said which cow they all look alike you mean this cow or maybe that cow and that sentence is built around this same verb, Shabha. The Jews were saying, it's not clear which one. It could be this cow or it could be that one. In the same way, some verses of the Quran could mean this or they could mean that. If, as this verse goes on to say, you take these verses apart from the ones that are locked in place, then try to give them a meaning and you'll go astray. It says the muhkamat are the basis. The ones that are locked in place will lead you through the ones that can be ambiguous. That is, they could mean this or they could mean that. But they can't have two meanings if you compare them to the ones that are locked in place. What happens to... Well, to give you an example, there is a man in uh, South America, in Guyana. He wrote a little book to the Muslims saying that according to the Quran, Jesus is God. And he proves it by quoting about seven different verses from the Quran. But you see, what he did was he tears those verses loose from their context and quotes them to you. If you put them back where they came from and compare them to the verses which are clear, they can't mean what he says they mean. The same kind of thing has happened then in so many times and places. When people have been given clear sayings and some sayings that are not quite so clear, they leave the clear and they pay attention to those things that can be bent this way or that way. Left behind the, the things that would guide them straight and took the things that they can shape into whatever they like. This, by the way, is not a defect in the Quran. 